allow me to introduce you to our opening fireside chat with Graham Codrington, who's a futurist, unlearner, and speaker at Tomorrow Today, and who's going to be speaking to Lizanne Gale, who's our very own head of learning and innovation here at Headspring. And together, they're going to be exploring the topic of responsible leadership. Over to you, Lizanne. Hello, and thank you for that introduction, Gustav. Um, welcome to the Headspring Learning Exchange 2.0. My name is Lizanne Gale, and I am the Global Head of Learning and Innovation at uh, Headspring Development. Um, I'm responsible for the teams and experts who do all of the diagnostics, design, and learning facilitation on our programs. And I'm very happy to be here today. Um, at Headspring, most of the work we do for our clients is some form of leadership development. And regardless of the specific context of the client in terms of industry, region, et cetera, or even the learning need that they may have, we are seeing a trend towards organizations looking to reframe leadership in a way that demands more from themselves, from those in positions of power, um, really looking at how they take part in society, not just in terms of the actual business that they operate in. And there's a desire for leaders to use their influence and their power and the resources that they have at their disposal in a way that's going to create a better world. So we really wanted to explore that idea further with an expert on the future of work and leadership, uh, Graham Codrington. So welcome, Graham. Thank you for being here today. Um, Graham is an incredible uh, person to know. I've had the pleasure of working with him in the past, and I hope to work with him far more in the future. He has seen the future and he loves it. He's a futurist, leadership specialist, and an expert on the future of work. He has six best-selling books to his name, clients in over 100 countries. Um, he helps organizations anticipate the forces that will shape their industries in the future. And he helps them also prepare for disruptive change today. So live from his home, uh, his home studio in Johannesburg, please welcome CEO of Tomorrow Today Global, Graham Codrington. Thank you very much, Graham, for being here. How are you doing? Doing very well. Thanks, Lizanne. It's lovely to be with you. Um, so why don't we jump right in because we know we have limited time. Uh, given the work that you do with your clients from around the world, what are, and what you're observing in the world right now, how would you define responsible leadership? The emphasis obviously being on the word responsible. And what do you think is causing any shifts towards this approach? It, it's a great question, Lizanne. And I think, I, I think most of us have an instinct for what that is. It's about doing good in the world and using our businesses and our positions uh, for the good of as many people as possible. I, I think in business that comes down to maybe the simple way of describing it is taking all stakeholders into account. So not just your shareholders, not just your salaried employees, but communities, the planet itself, uh, probably being a stakeholder if we can think of it that way. Uh, and, and it's about how do we maximize the good or the benefit for all of those stakeholders, not just a few. But I'd like to approach the topic from a different way, because I think we kind of have that in our heads. I, I think we're in a very interesting space. You ask what's causing or pushing the shift towards responsible leadership. I, I, I've got a suggestion. Uh, I think for the last 70 or 80 years, we've had two big models in the world of how to deliver good to societies. And they've been fighting it out, capitalism and communism. These are two very different ways to achieve a good for society. And, and, and capitalism tells us that if we get the entrepreneurs going, if we get the business going, if we let the, the markets run, uh, then the benefits will, will trickle down and the economy will flourish and everybody will benefit. Uh, communism says, no, we've got to distribute the ownership uh, and make sure that we've got centralized control and ensure that all of the um, that, that all of the people in the system benefit, but, but centrally controlled. 
neither of those two systems have succeeded. Uh, mm -hmm. In fairness to both of them, neither of them were ever implemented in their pure forms. Um, and so maybe we haven't had a good enough run yet. But I think we're living at a moment mm -hmm. where we kind of all realize whatever system you're in and whatever system you feel drawn to, and maybe you think there's a compromise halfway in between, and we call that socialism. I'm not sure that's quite what socialism is. But anyway, mm -hmm. I think we're in a moment where we say, we're not really sure. We, we want to all do the good thing. We un, want to all do the right thing. We want to all take more stakeholders seriously. I'm just not sure we know how to do it. I think that's terribly exciting because I think that leaders and organizations uh, around the world live at this interregnum period of history where we kind of go, eh, we can... We, we can make different decisions. We can try different things. We can experiment doing uh, different ways and see if we come up with better results uh, than we ever have. And for me, that's the essence now of responsible leadership. It's not just doing what we've always done, but slightly better and cheaper and faster. It's actually taking a moment to try and work out what the good thing is or the good things are that can be done by different organizations, different structures in different places. So uh, a long answer to, to a nice opening question, but that's kind of the approach I bring. It's a lot bigger than just trying to find slightly better ways to do business. I think there's a, there's a moment in history uh, waiting for us to, to step into. And what I take away from what you've just said there is um, something around uh, the uncertainty of this type of leadership, because given that these two big forms of organizing the world haven't worked, um, there, there is no right answer and that leaders have to hold a space there where they're comfortable with that. And so just delving a little bit deeper into that, what would you say are the critical practices of responsible leadership day in, day out? What do these leaders have to do, which is different from the old way of, of showing up as a leader? Possibly three things jump to mind. The first is I think we've got to think longer term. Uh, a focus on quarterly profits, especially out of the United States. It's just, I think it's killing us. It's killing our businesses. We've got to find a way to get our shareholders, to get our stakeholders to work with us, to think longer term in terms of the consequences of, of our decision making. I think we have to, secondly, engage all of those stakeholders. I think we've got to talk more to the communities that are influenced uh, by what we do. And thirdly, and that's related, I think we've got to aim to be more inclusive, distribute decision-making a little bit more, um, distribute authority uh, maybe a little bit more. It's very interesting that even the most capitalistic of organizations tend to choose a reasonably authoritarian and hierarchical leadership structure in order to get things done. And somewhere the future is, I think, in, in distributing some of that decision making a little bit more. I think the organizations that are showing they're responsible are, are at least doing those three things and, and a lot more besides. Yeah. So if we go to the first point, just to, um, to understand a little bit more, what kind of horizons do you think would make more sense? For organizing. You know, it really, it, Lizanne, it really depends on the industry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the work that I do as a, as a futurist, sadly, I don't have a, a crystal ball, so I'm not predicting anything, but I'm looking for patterns. And, mm -hmm. and the way I describe what I do is for a client, you've got a planning horizon. Now, this will be different depending on which industry you're in. Mm -hmm. Some of my clients are in aerospace and, uh, you know, nuclear power, and they might have a 10, 15-year lead time. Mm -hmm. Others are app developers where a 10, 15-week lead time would be a luxury. And so what I think a long-term means is you've got to look beyond your current planning cycle. So I talk about uh, looking at what happens after what comes next. So it'll be different in different industries, but I think it's, it's just about looking beyond where your current planning cycle takes you to. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I know that you're one of these people who you don't just talk the talk, you actually walk the walk. So I'd like to know from your perspective, um, how does this concept of responsible leadership show up for you and what you do? I think in our team at Tomorrow Today, uh, 
there would be a number of ways that that, that would happen. I think uh, we, we do try and think of our impact on the planet. Uh, as mm -hmm. you, uh, you said, I've got clients in over 100 countries. Um, I've, I've loved the fact that I haven't had to get in an airplane uh, for the last uh, two years. Uh, and a lot of that's got to do with impact on the planet. Before then, we try to be carbon neutral by buying carbon credits and so on. So it's just, it's a way of thinking around that. But maybe something more practical, because I think for me, a lot of people skip the idea of inclusion, mm -hmm. making sure that everybody's included. And a very simple example that might be a big step for, for people listening to this is we've normalized talking about everybody's salaries and what everybody earns. Everybody in our business knows what everybody else earns, and they also know how that is earned. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, people don't really earn salaries, including myself, uh, in our business. We, there are multiple ways in which you can generate income um, mm -hmm. through the activities and the contributions that you make, and all of those are open to everybody. Now, I know that that's not going to work in every organization, but it's a mindset shift. It's a mindset shift towards transparency and openness and allowing everybody to benefit from the fruits of their labor. Um, and again, uh, if to, my, to the capitalistic audience here, that's sounding a little bit like communism, well, so be it. We're experimenting. We're trying to come up with stuff uh, that changes how we engage. So normalize talking about salaries. Uh, it'll really, Lizanne, it'll really help women as well. The, the, the pay gap disappears when, when men and women realize that two people doing the same work are being paid different amounts of money. I, I don't see why we shouldn't know that. Anyway, simple mm -hmm. example, but, but maybe scary for some people to contemplate. And how has that gone down in, in your organization? How, what was the transition to doing that like? Uh, we haven't really transitioned. We, we we're in our twentieth year, and we've kind of always done it. I, okay. I think it's a little bit wow. it's a little bit weird for people coming into the organisation, and I think some people take a little bit of a deep breath the first month where we <laughs> kind of you know just point people to the online spreadsheet and say you know there's your salary and that's how to organise, and they suddenly realise everybody's salary is listed. Um, wow. So it kind of takes people by surprise, but. But people love it. It, it not, it's not for everybody. I think one or two of people over the in, in, in the past have maybe left us because it just didn't work for them. But I think for most people, it's it's a combination of being aspirational. Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, they they see, oh, I, somebody else earned a lot more than me, but this is why. This is what they contributed and why they were rewarded in that way. Um, and, and I think for most people, it, it gives them a sense of being part of a team and, and, and being part of a collective effort rather than just being a cog in the machine. Absolutely. So that's a fantastic example in, in your own, um, in terms of your own organization. What other examples have you seen out there in broader society? Because I think looking for those role models, looking for those exa mm. exemplars that really bring this to life would be quite useful. Where have you seen this really and let, let me give you a let me give you a small example and a big example. And and to go back to my initial thoughts, for me, responsible leadership is about inclusion mm -hmm. and benefit to others. So you're thinking about others. You're trying to think about how people who may be different to you and don't have the same circumstances as you might still get benefit from the work that you do. So a small example is one of our clients is a law firm. And when everybody went into lockdown last year and were forced to, uh, to work from home, yeah, I can probably mention uh, they, they were London based. So everybody was told you're not allowed to come to work. They realized that there were a number of women uh, who sadly this is a, a, a tough story to hear, a number of women who were facing abusive situations in their home lives because now they had a partner or somebody else at home. They didn't have a home set up in which they could feel safe. This mm -hmm. firm just said, no, you can come to the office. It feels like a small story. I think it's a huge story mm -hmm. of responsible leadership. It's about a leadership thinking beyond uh, you know, the, 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 the structures beyond, the, even in this case, beyond the regulations, uh, as it may happen, um, to just say, how do we do the best for our community? Yeah. Small example, but maybe a big one. Uh, yeah. A big example is Anne Hidalgo, who was uh, elected as mayor of uh, Paris last year, in June, during, during lockdown. And she announced that the Paris Olympics in 2024 will be plastic free. 
And what she did was she used the COVID mindset. She said, hey, here in Paris, we've been able to change people's behaviors, implement uh, by regulation big changes. Mm -hmm. And why can't we do that with everything? She wasn't going to wait for COP26 and years and years of of negotiation discussion. She's from the Green Party. So she said, I have the power. I'm using my power. Thank you very much. A um, whole lot of my clients are impacted from the likes of Nestle, Coca-Cola, Kraft, Heinz, and that too. Uh, I'll say they freaked out for a few hours and go, whoa, how do we get plastic free by 2024? And then of course realized, no, it's possible. We can do this. And so as far as I understand, the Olympics in 2024 will be plastic free thanks to a responsible leader saying, let's just do this. Yeah. So on the flip side of that, can you give an example of where you think it, there's a, a, a real absence of responsible leadership and, and the effects are being felt? I, I, I think we've seen that all over the place with managers who felt the need to micromanage people working from home. I mean, from the most horrific stories of people putting keystroke uh, accounts on their employees' laptops to make sure that they were working. But I think a lot of managers have to have to acknowledge to themselves that they struggled during lockdown because they really didn't trust mm -hmm. uh, their employees and their focus was more on productivity rather than wellness. And I think that most of our employees uh, yeah, they. I, I think they showed up, a lot of managers, because we thought they might be lazy at home. I think they've worked harder than they should have. And yeah. again, if we can look forward, responsible leadership in 2022, 2023 will take employee wellness yeah. as seriously, if not more seriously, than employee pr productivity and efficiency. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um for those leaders who want to, to really put this into practice and do more of, right, and find ways to develop themselves in this space, what are some of the risks that they might want to be aware of in doing this work? Look, the, the biggest risk is you get fired because the shareholders don't like the fact that the profit isn't increasing as much as it could have. Because if you're going to do this, you're probably going to have a dip, dip in profitability initially because you've got to take your foot off that productivity efficiency pedal in order to set up systems and structures. Yeah. I think that that is mitigated by longer term in the, twin, in the rest of the 2020s and 30s. People are going to reward you for mm -hmm. being responsible organizations. But you're going to have to take your shareholders with you in the short term. I, I think that's the biggest danger uh, for a leader or a leadership team uh, right now. Yeah. So then where would you suggest that leaders start? We're going to wrap this up now. For those who yeah, are... It, it, it's exactly that, Lizanne, is you've yeah. got to sell the vision, right? You've yeah. got to talk about it. You, you've got to make responsibility or responsible leadership visible. You can't just bring it in by sneak attack to your leadership team. You've actually got to sell it. Yeah. sell the vision, build a guiding coalition of your leadership, take it to your shareholders and sell it to them. Um, and the danger is that because you can't do it perfectly every, everywhere, you think, well, it's not even worth doing anything. Yeah. So if you want to, if, if, if this is something that kind of sparks with you, just start somewhere um, and, 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 and bring it in, but, but talk about it and sell the vision. Yeah. And I think that is a, a good place to wrap up. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, any final thoughts before we hand it back to Central? I, I, I just think that if people really do sit back and think about this, they will know how important it is. That yeah. you can probably survive the next few years by just pushing productivity and pushing profitability. But I think you know already that you won't keep your staff that your clients will choose other companies that are responsible. You've got a hashtag brigade coming after you if you don't. <laughs> um, and this is the right thing to do. So why do you want to be the leader who doesn't do it and history remembers you as not doing it rather than being the leader who does do it and history remembers you as maybe changing the course of your organization and industry? Do it. Yes. I think that's, that's a great place to stop. Just 
do it. <laughs> I know that's going to bring to mind a, a famous corporation out there, but I, I love that as a, as a way to end. So thank you very much, Graham, for your time and for help spark uh, sparking some ideas about how to be more responsible in, in one's leadership. And um, really appreciate your time today. Thank you.